Coming up on Market to Market. Playing fair in the world trading arena. A green wave rides on without the U.S. And hunters fill empty plates in the heartland. Venison. Those stories and market analysis with Naomi Bloom, next. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. And by Sukup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sukup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, December 15 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Last month, lower prices gave rural Americans a chance to spruce up the home place and make holiday travel plans. Retail sales bumped up eight-tenths of a percent in November as the price of airline tickets and new furniture declined. Despite the drop in prices, core inflation, the rate that excludes food and energy, grew two-tenths of a percent last month, hitting an annualized rate of 1.7%. The Federal Reserve Board kept its word and raised interest rates to 1.5% along with plans for expansion in the new year. The U.S. government's trade representative opened this week's WTO meeting with a salvo, saying the group has lost focus on its mission and is, quote, becoming a litigious-centered organization. The ministerial-level meeting ended with no final agreements on issues involving agriculture, e-commerce, development, and fishery subsidies. Protesters are commonplace at World Trade Organization events, and this episode featured small farmers protesting land distribution policies. The topic was being debated at the summit between the 164 member countries of the WTO. The U.S. leveled criticism in the early moments of the conference, arguing many countries received different treatment. We cannot sustain a situation in which new rules can only apply to a few and that others will be given a pass in the name of self-proclaimed development status. Others agreed with the U.S. Trade Rep's assessment that not all is fair in trading. We need to have a clear objective in mind. For the European Union, this is clear, to preserve and to strengthen the rules-based multilateral trading system. And for it to thrive, it has to develop. It is not perfect, but it's the best we have, and we have achieved great things together, and we can. Other member countries were urging the U.S. to honor current agreements promoting fair, free access to government contracts. President Donald Trump gave his administration high marks this week for withdrawing or delaying over 1,500 regulatory actions. As the president was cutting a red ribbon in D.C., a large number of world leaders were meeting with one of those dropped rules. Peter Tubbs reports. More than 50 world political and economic leaders met in Paris this week, seeking to regain momentum in their plans to combat climate change. Former California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger assured the gathering work on mitigating climate change can continue despite the actions of President Donald Trump. It doesn't matter that Donald Trump backed out of the Paris Agreement because the private sector didn't drop out, the public sector didn't drop out, universities didn't drop out, scientists didn't drop out, engineers didn't drop out, no one dropped out. Donald Trump pulled Donald Trump out of the Paris Agreement, so don't worry about any of that. We on a subnational level, we're going to pick up the slack and we're going to continue on. We will fight and we will create the kind of great, great future for our children and grandchildren because that is our responsibility and no one will stop us. 
French President Emmanuel Macron is seeking to place France in the center of the climate change leadership vacuum created when the United States abandoned the Paris Climate Accords in June. Multiple projects to reduce carbon emissions, as well as assisting nations most affected by a changing climate, were announced at the gathering. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Dicamba has been a savior for many row crop farmers over its half century of use. Unfortunately, new formulations of the herbicide have created new problems. Colleen Bradford Krantz has more. Several Midwestern states have taken steps to more strictly limit when new formulations of the weed killer dicamba can be applied during the growing season. North Dakota, Missouri, and Minnesota have all either enacted or proposed limits on late spring or summer use of the herbicide, or banned its use when temperatures climb above 85 degrees. Arkansas had earlier moved toward limitations during most of the growing season, but state officials are reconsidering. Hundreds of growers in multiple states have reported problems with dicamba damaging nearby non-target fields. Monsanto, one of the companies with a new formulation of dicamba designed to be less prone to volatization, turning from liquid to vapor, said it investigated about 1,200 complaints and believes 90% of the problems occurred when farmers or other applicators failed to follow existing label requirements. In response to concerns, the Environmental Protection Agency did toughen labeling requirements in October, and those planning to apply the reformulated chemicals must now have special training. In most cases, state-level limitations will not affect use of dicamba for off-season burndown. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford-Krantz. USDA data reveals one in eight U.S. citizens are food insecure in a land where the cornucopia overflows. Food banks try to fill the gap, but some items are in short supply. However, deep in the heartland, hunters are helping fill empty plates. Josh Bittner has our cover story. It brings the wildlife in and then it allows that soil to kind of, kind of come back a little bit from being farmed for years and years. Only about half of Mike Nelson's acres in central Iowa's Warren County are devoted to row crops. He's invested the remainder of his rolling landscape in USDA's Conservation Reserve Program. My whole family, the one thing that we enjoy the most is the outdoors and the wildlife that comes with it. And I think a lot of this ground is ground that shouldn't be farmed. It's highly erodible. By having a portion of his land in CRP, Nelson cost shares the conversion of his farm ground to retain topsoil, improve water quality, and restore natural habitat. However, one woodland creature can respond a little too well to such rural accommodations. As a hunter, that's what we want to see. That's telling us that we have a buck in the area. Iowa corn and soybeans might help feed the world, but those same growing areas provide shelter and nutrition for four-legged drifters which some landowners consider a nuisance. They'll just devastate our crops, and, and if we didn't harvest some of those, we'd just get overrun, and, and we'd have way too many deer. But Nelson has found a way to decrease numbers in his own backyard and uproot hunger locally, thanks to a partnership between outdoorsmen, meat lockers, nonprofits, and state government. We've got as many top 100 scored deer in the country as any other state. We've come on strong. Um, you know, we have one of the most in-demand non-resident deer licenses. We do limit those to 6,000, but our bow deer tags are probably the most in-demand deer license in the country. Iowa Department of Natural Resources spokesman Mick Clemisrud says nearly 15 years ago, the DNR hatched a plan to cut back on a deer population that had become a hazard in urban areas and allow hunters to donate excess harvest to those in need. While roadkill is ineligible, what followed was the statewide HUSH program, or Help Us Stop Hunger. Iowa's deer are world-class deer, and they're really a prestigious animal to hunt. And what we've done is we've structured our season so we can make sure that those large-bodied animals can pass their genetics on before the gun season start. Not a lot of other states do that, and they don't have the same deer quality deer herd that we do. 
DNR officials estimate Iowa's current deer population at roughly half a million. Clemisrud says herd size spiked around 2007, and an uptick in hush donations followed at over 8,300 animals the following year. The program's first decade saw over 63,000 deer, equaling more than 10 million meals provided by Iowa hunters. Last year, about 2,800 deer were donated, with the largest number coming from Milo, Iowa. Milo Locker co-owner Daryl Goring says that's just shy of 18,000 pounds. We are in deer country. South Central Iowa is a great place to be if you're a deer hunter, and uh, we're, just, we're just blessed to be here. Processors receive $75 from the state for each animal. The meat is shredded and packaged in two-pound chubs and given to food banks for distribution. Real lean, lean red meat. So if you're watching your cholesterol or things like that, then deer is a good thing to eat. Goring says all parties involved benefit under the agreement. And together, they've streamlined how hunters contribute. All a hunter needs to do is uh, legally harvest a, a white-tailed deer, properly tag it, field dress it, bring it in. It's really, you know, two minutes, and the paperwork's filled out, little index card, and he's good to go. And uh, we take over from there. Over two dozen lockers participate in the program and work with eight food banks serving those who are food insecure across the state. Danny Ackright, communications manager with the Des Moines-based Food Bank of Iowa, says proteins like meat are one of the most difficult nutritional products to come by. But in 2016, his nonprofit received 17,000 pounds of venison through Hush. And he points out the huge advantage of being able to take the show on the road. One of the misconceptions that a lot of people have about those who are hungry is that it's an inner city problem, when really it's an everywhere problem. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. And really, in our rural communities, is one of the hardest places to reach them. They may not have access to traditional food resource like a food pantry or a soup kitchen, so we have to, to design programs like the mobile food pantry to go in and meet those needs in those rural communities. Venison? Oh, I think it's great. I'm not a Des Moines driver, not even very far. So it is nice to have it come to Milo. You know, it's really, really helped. Ackright says feedback from recipients, as well as those canvassing woods and fields, has been overwhelmingly positive. One of the things that I love to hear is when hunters tell us that they are active hush hunters. For them, it's a sport of passion. They love to do it. They will hunt and take down a deer and help feed their own family. And when they have the ability to provide that, that nutritious meat to a family in need, that means something to them. Make chili with it. Mike Nelson agrees. From tree stand or deer blind, he helps manage an Iowa resource with high reproduction rates and few, if any, natural predators. One deer for us is plenty. Otherwise, it'd just go to waste in one of two ways. You'd either have it processed and it'd sit in your freezer and you'd never eat it, or you wouldn't harvest the deer to begin with and then you'd just be overrun with them. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Rain in South America and too much product pressed down on the corn and soybean markets. For the week, March wheat continued to battle in a narrow range and finished flat, while the nearby corn contract fell a nickel. The soybean market fought against plentiful supply and good growing weather in Argentina as the January soybean contract plunged 23 cents. January meal lost 11.10 per ton. March cotton stretched higher, another 2.20 per hundred weight. Over in the dairy parlor, January Class 3 milk futures surged a dime. The livestock complex finished mixed as the February cattle contract put on 273 and nearby feeders added $2.52. The February lean hog contract shed 32 cents. The U.S. dollar index kicked five points higher. January crude oil slid six cents per barrel. Comex gold poured on an additional 9.10 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index dropped half a point to close at 419.65. 
Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Naomi Bloom. Naomi, welcome back. Thank you. Good to see you. And before we uh, get to her and you want to go thing, over things again, you can download or listen to our Market Analysis and Market Plus podcast online anytime at IPTV.org slash MTOM. Naomi, you shouldn't, I shouldn't answer my own question, but wheat is suffering, I would imagine, from an oversupply even when it's super dry and beginning to get super dry in the co in the wheat belt of this country. Is that really what's in play here is a supply problem? It is, and, and that is something that the USDA reiterated again this week on the USDA report, increasing the global carryout, increasing U.S. numbers. There's just no end in sight right now. The surplus is there, and our exports just haven't picked up. The, the global competition, especially from Russia and the Black Sea region, is stealing the show, stealing the thunder, and it's likely to continue that for a way for a while. Uh, to your point, though, the market is very aware of the dryness in the plains, but it's too early to really trade it or talk about it yet. So it's on the back burner for now, but something that could come up, and that might be a market mover in the coming months. But for now, uh, we're kind of stuck here for a little bit in terms of prices. So is that one of those things that gets shelved until after the first of the year? You need a good snowstorm, you need a good uh, cold snap in Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas before anything happens? Right, it would have to be that along with a lack of snow cover in order to get some sort of a short covering bounce. The funds though just today came out with another just like record short position for this time of year, just a relentless going to keep pressure on the, on the market in terms of their belief that there's no reason for the wheat price to come up. So it's, it, they'll take a weather issue not only here, but somewhere else in the world. Is it time to make any sales or even if a buy if you're looking to fill in some feed needs on, with wheat? Well, if you are an end user and you're wanting to buying, yeah, it's a great time. It is on sale and you should actually be booking for you know six months out because this is the cheapest it's going to get. Um, but in terms of if you're a producer who needs to sell, I think you can be patient. There's usually some sort of a weather scare that comes down the road. Just make sure you're disciplined to pull the trigger and actually sell it when you see that happen. So it's the season for holiday sales. So we've got one going on in wheat. Do we have a holiday sale in corn right now? Corn market's still also cheap and that price is sliding lower as the December contract went off the board this week. The March contract now looks like before everything is said and done is going to maybe go down and test the 340 price level on March futures. That should be a very good support level because then by then we'll be done with the holiday trade, we'll be done with the light volume, and then we'll start to switch gears into January with the big USDA report. And then we'll get into more weather scenarios with South America at that time too. So we see the weather conditions, as you mentioned, we'll get into that more with soybeans, but on this nearby, I mean, you see that drop off and you keep seeing it go down. Is there a bottom anytime soon? Yeah, it's it's happening. The you process think it's is now. happening. Yeah, and the, the, the friendly story with corn continues to be ethanol. And we saw that on the USDA report. They increased the ethanol, uh, corn use for ethanol. And that is likely to continue. And even though we may be capped out right now with our E10, we are exporting ethanol in large amounts. China is importing ethanol. And Japan now has said that they're going to be importing U.S. corn-based ethanol because they've been using the sugarcane ethanol from Brazil. But ours is 35% cheaper. So finally, we have some more export markets to come. So corn is going to find some support from the ethanol numbers, but the big picture is that we still have too much for carryout here in this country for right now. So it'll probably be quiet for a few weeks, but I think we are forming a longer term bottom. Because we're the cheapest in the Gulf for a number of commodities uh, because the other places are more expensive, but you would think long term, that, does that have any, you're saying that it has a, it's going to take a little longer to get there before more sales. Right. Okay. Right. Yes. All right. Soybeans wise, uh, before we get to that, I want to ask a, a question that we received via our Facebook page. And you can always follow us at IPTV Market on Facebook. And Jared in Mattoon, Illinois, he wants to know what's more likely, corn to rally or beans to crash? And that is a great question. And I'm going to cap out with my answer on it depends on <laughs> South American weather. The soybean market for the past three weeks has been consolidating into a sideways pattern. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we had that nice price spike higher. A lot of cash sales were made, which was important. And now, as of today's close, we got contracts for the January near 965. The March is at 975. And those are tremendous support levels. If we come back on Sunday night and if the weather in South America changes to where, oh, it 
didn't rain right. like they thought, or, oh, it might have rained, but just not quite as much, that'll get the trade higher on Sunday night trade and then give us a lift for next week. The risk, though, is that if it rains and more than that, what they think, then it's going to be a pretty quick technical washout, meaning prices and the funds will sell the market off, potentially about 40 cents to the downside. So be on your toes for Sunday night trade, on Monday morning trade, because it really does matter. And, you know, we've lost 50 cents in about 10 days on beans, and yeah. you're saying there's a potential could go even lower if there's rain in South America. Yes, very, okay. very likely. It's All right, uh, we'll get to cotton in Market Plus, Naomi. And when you're here, uh, we always like to tap into yeah. your dairy knowledge. Uh, you've had a pretty down market in dairy. A little bit of a pick back up this week. Give us some hope for a, a rebound. No. No. <laughs> No. <laughs> Your look so, says it all. No. Um, <laughs> there was an exciting trade with the milk market this week, though. And the, what happened was that the block price for cheese rallied $0.07, cents, which in the, in the cheese world, that's kind of a big deal. So it was enough to spur the milk price. The class three might price higher. And in fact, in this week, there was a $0.70 cent trading range for the January milk contract, which is amazing for a trading range. And it went all the way from support up to technical resistance levels and then sold off so that when week at finished, it wasn't that much of a rally. Our problem is that we have so much milk production. The most recent report was that production was up 1.4% from a year ago. And the production is growing. Our cheese levels in commercial storage are huge right now, 95 million pounds. Last year at this time it was 75 million pounds, and we're just not getting rid of the cheese fast enough, and it's probably because we're making so much milk. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, it's hard for the dairy producers. We're going to likely see milk prices in the low $14 level for a little while longer yet. We need the exports to pick up, um, or maybe some harsh winter weather or something like that, but it's tricky. Those f producers have break-evens up at 16 and $17. So it is not a friendly story for a little while for milk, but milk cycles and something will happen down the road, but for now we're stuck. So pick up an levels. extra cheese tray this holiday season. <laughs> right. All right, you also maybe, uh, looks like more people were buying cattle. Uh, I mean, the, 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 cattle, the, the, the cattle market up 273, yeah. a 2%, a rebound now. That's, uh, we're maybe putting a streak together? Yeah, so what happened there was that we had our holiday demand met two weeks ago. Prices slid lower between cash and futures. And now today we had cash tra cattle trade finally like at about at 120, which was very good. And the market, the futures market was oversold. So it was finally time for a bounce higher, a nice weekly reversal on charts. And so I think we found our short term bottom, but the cattle market doesn't have a reason to rally. So I would see more of a a sideways trading range for the next two weeks. We'll have a cattle and feed report before the year end is out, so that'll be the next thing that we're looking at. But our exports have been strong, domestic demand is strong. Um, so I don't see the cattle prices falling lower, mm -hmm. but we don't have a reason to really get prices pushing a lot higher either. If you need to make some sales, maybe take advantage right now is maybe what you're saying. Just a little bit, not yeah. a full on, okay. Right, all I right. would agree now, with that. All right, what about feeders? Uh, again, Similar story. Mm -hmm. Yep, similar story, similar trading action on charts. Uh, absolutely the same type of a thing. We're probably not going to see too much of anything transpire over the next couple of weeks, but more unlikely to see prices fall a lot lower. Okay. All right, with hogs, uh, that's a market. That thing has been all over the board this fall, and it continued again this week, this time a decline by half a percent, 32 cents on the week. What's going on there? Cutout values were lower. The, the cash market in general was lower. Production, of course, is stronger. The exports had been really good, and that's what lifted the market higher a few weeks ago. Uh, right now, where the market is at, the February contract has strong support at the 66 level. What I'm fearful of going forward is what our exports will do in terms of not only the value of the dollar and NAFTA and things like that, but China is now expected to nearly double the size of, size of their herd in the coming years. And that's a good chunk of where our you know, hogs are marketed to. So we have to be watching that. That is, I think, the most important fundamental factor to be watching in 2018 is how much of our exports are still going to China or are we seeing their production levels increase so much because with the amount of new hogs that have come into market and the new production facilities that are going in, I'm a little nervous. Uh, if that 66 level on the February contract fails, the technical downside on futures is 62. So mm. there's some risk there. And this next couple of weeks is a big deal. So really 
be aware of what all of the hog complex is doing. And paying attention to China, as always, like yeah, we do for right, everything. Right. All right, Naomi Bloom, I appreciate your time. Uh, right. As always, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, and that will wrap up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. However, we will keep the conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, which is available in podcast and video form on our website. And you know, sometimes 280 characters is all you need to keep connected while taking your grain to town. Our Twitter feed of Market to Market is here for news, photos, and links. Why don't you give us a follow? Join us again next week when we'll explore how one community college is creating a holiday staple in the classroom. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Paul Yeager. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.